Well, hello there. It is great to see you again, and welcome back to another installment of Closing Arguments. I'm your host and moderator, Ryan Ruff, and in a few mim- minutes, I'll be bringing out really the star of our show, Mr. John Razumich, or Jack Razumich, as those close to him know him by, uh, from the Razumich & Associates firm in the greater Indianapolis area. We've got another criminal law-related discussion tuned up for you today. That's what we do here on the show. And really, you know, it, we've we've had a lot of great conversations on the show. We've covered a handful of different case studies from different, uh, you know, monumental you know, legal landmarks that we've seen throughout our time. And then of course, some other legal landmarks that are close to, you know, to Jack's experiences. Last episode, we had a great conversation surrounding the curious case of the hot dog man. This is one of the, you know, really interesting cases that Jack has been experienced to direct or, you know, that was directly involved with uh, throughout his time practicing criminal law, a really well-known case throughout the Indianapolis area. I would highly recommend traveling back and checking out that roller coaster of a case study. That is the curious case of the hot dog man. But today we're going to zoom out a little bit. We're going to take a much more broad approach today. We are looking at a brief history of the Supreme court, you know, a lot of our discussions in past episodes have had some sort of involvement within the Supreme Court, but today we're going to be kind of unpacking, you know, what really does the Supreme Court do and how it's evolved over time, you know, the monumental decisions that it's handed down over the last few decades. There's just a lot of great information to unpack within the Supreme Court as a whole. So that being said, let's go ahead and bring Jack out and get today's conversation rolling. Jack, good to see you. How are you doing today? Hey, Ryan, not too bad. Good to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. Always a good time when we can get together for uh, another episode here. Today, Jack, we are talking about the Supreme Court, uh, the be-all, end-all of the legal the legal world. Let's start kind of high level here, Jack. I think a good way to frame things up is getting into this idea of just laying out the, you know, almost the obvious. What does the Supreme Court do? Let's start there um, and, and get into really the inner workings of the Supreme Court, uh, you know, not only throughout the past, but of course leading up to today. Definitely. And uh, we chose this topic today because the Supreme Court is very clearly in the news right now. The Supreme Court seems to have been in the news for at least the last four or five years. It seems like there's not a day that goes by without talking about the Supreme Court. And uh, with the current nomination hearings involving um, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, it seemed like it was a good time to go over the history of the Supreme Court. This is going to be a brief history. Um, Nearly every topic that we're going to try to cover today could easily by itself fill at least a full hours podcast, probably multiple hours worth of podcast. So um, if you're listening and you're a Supreme court history fan and we don't cover something that you really wanted to hear covered or, uh, or you think we didn't give a, a particular era or decision or um, judicial officer enough attention, by all means, just let us know, Le- leave it in the comment section when you, when you watch this later and we will more than happily revisit the situation. Um, Regarding what the Supreme Court does, we, we touched on this a little bit back when we did the United States versus ship case. The Supreme Court was is established by the United States Constitution, it's Article 3 of the Constitution. Um, here, is, here is verbatim the establishment of the Supreme Court. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. That's basically it. That's that is that is all the effort they really put into <laughs> establishing the Supreme Court. And if you look at the way that the Constitution was written originally back in mm-hmm. in 1787 to 1788, most of the attention was on the legislature because the legislature was that was the that was the big function. That was that was the parliamentary system was going to pass the laws, uh, you know, run how the country was going to go. The judiciary, the Supreme Court was considered to be the least dangerous branch of the federal government back when all of this was set together because they really didn't have any idea what the Supreme Court was going to do. There There was an awareness that this is what courts do. But the idea of a Supreme Court, that that was a uniquely American thing. The Supreme Court of England, uh, which is where we got a lot of our legal traditions from, that Mm -hmm. was actually the House of Lords in Parliament. There was not a separate Mm. Supreme Court. It was just basically one House of Parliament making those decisions. So the idea that the Supreme Court was going to be a co-equal independent body that did anything was kind of really not fleshed out. They just just didn't put Mm -hmm. anything in there. 
well, given how how vague that verbiage is in Article Three of the Constitution, I mean, you could tell it was just an it was it was an idea, really. So right. where, Jack, where along the line did the powers of the Supreme Court come to be? Definitely over time. Um, mm-hmm. The the way that the powers developed, you, you have to kind of chart the history of the Supreme Court from its inception through John Marshall, who is the fourth Chief Justice of the United States. Um, the first Chief Justice of the United States was John Jay. John Jay was, um, like a lot of people at this time, he fought in the Revolutionary War for American independence. Um, he was one of the three principal authors of the Federalist Papers, which is one of those, uh, it's a document, a series of, of editorials that were published around the country to basically drum up support for the ratification of the Constitution of the United States. John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison were the three principal authors on that. When the federal government, when, when the first federal government uh, came into being in uh, 1789, most of the people who are responsible for framing it, of course, were given various positions. And when, when it came to John Jay, George Washington, uh, who, of course, we all know is the first president, offered John Jay first the position of Secretary of State. Um, that was turned down because John Jay had spent uh, most of the time during the, the Articles of the Confederacy, America's first government, in the foreign ministry, for lack of a way of describing it. He wanted to do something different. So President Washington offered him the position of Chief Justice of the United States, which was a position that was created specifically for John Jay. If you recall that verbatim short sentence that, that I talked about, there's no establishment of a chief justice. It, it's simply not there. It just says there will be a Supreme Court, but the, the factors of what go into how does the Supreme Court look like, what does the Supreme Court do, again, there's not anything there. They're making it up as they go along, for lack of a way of putting it. So uh, President Washington offers John Jay the position of chief justice, which created that position. Um, and originally at the time, the Supreme Court, um, the, the Judiciary Act of 1789 uh, set the total number of justices at six. There was a chief justice and five associate justices. So John Jay got to be the first chief justice. Um, interesting quirks about Chief Justice Jay, um, he wore a scarlet robe. Like the other, the other, the five associate justices all wore the traditional black robes that you see judges wear. John Jay was a bit more flamboyant and decided that if you were the chief <laughs> justice, you might as well kind of stand out. So so John Look Jay wore a, a bright scarlet robe during his tenure on the Supreme Court. Wow. Because the country was so young, John Jay actually only heard, or, or his court only heard four cases during the time that he was chief justice of the United wow. States. He was chief justice uh, for about six years, 1789 to 1795. Mm-hmm. They only heard four cases during that time. And he actually quit to run for governor of New York because he was bored. If you're only working a handful of days a year uh, with four cases throughout that process. Oh, that's funny. So yeah, we ran for governor in New York. What happened next? Um, when John Jay, when John Jay stepped down, he retired from the Supreme court. Uh, there was a mm-hmm. recess appointment for associate justice, John Rutledge, who is the shortest tenured chief justice in United States history. He was only chief justice for 138 days. He was not confirmed by the Senate when they came back into session because as shocking as it might be for our, ve- our, our listeners and our viewers to hear, once upon a time, Congress actually did adjourn. They didn't actually just stay in Washington <laughs> 365 days a year. So recess appointments were a little yeah. bit more common. Uh, John Rutledge was uh, the recess appointment by President Washington. Despite the fact that he was only there for 138 days, they decided two cases during his tenure in 1795. Um, Oliver Ellsworth was the third chief justice appointed by Washington, who served until 1800, at which point in time we get to the first real establishment of the Supreme Court as kind of an independent body that does its own thing. And that came with the appointment of John Marshall as the fourth chief justice of the United States. And it's, it is impossible really to say what the Supreme Court would or would not look like if it weren't for John Marshall. Everything that we think of with regards to the way the court works, 
is basically a result of, of the martial court and the way that they establish the authority. Um, first thing with regards to Marshall that, that I personally want to, uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank him for the reason that Amer that lawyers in America don't wear wigs when they're in court is because of John Marshall. He got rid of that tradition. Uh, John Jay and, and, uh, and, um, uh, John Rutledge and Oliver Ellsworth, they, they maintain the English tradition of, of lawyers go to court wearing wigs. Uh, John Marshall got rid of that. So I assure you, we are all quite thankful for that. Our <laughs> friends, I don't know. I think you'd look good in one there, Jack. Our friends, our friends in, 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 uh, in Canada and across the pond in England still wear, uh, mm -hmm. wigs and I've, I've seen pictures and, um, no, I'm, 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 I'm glad the way we are <laughs> Not right for now. you. <laughs> um, John Marshall also got rid of the the, the scarlet robe. Uh, he, he viewed himself mm -hmm. as being first among equals, but not that much yeah. first beyond equals. Um, so that's why you see the justices just in, in traditional black robes like they have right now. Mm -hmm. The first major decision that really came out of the Marshall Court is Marbury versus Madison. And, and Marbury mm -hmm. versus Madison is the case that established the concept of what represents judicial review. And judicial review is the idea that the Supreme Court is the final say on whether or not an act of Congress violates the Constitution. This is not written in the Constitution anywhere. You're not going to find the concept of, you know, the Supreme Court has this authority. We've just told you what the Supreme Court's authority was. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they don't have this power, but the facts of this case are when um, during the election, uh, during the election of 1800 uh, between President John Adams and uh, incoming President Thomas Jefferson, uh, it was a particularly nasty election. There was a lot, you know, we think that modern elections are really bad. I don't think you understand how nasty that election was. One of John Adams's last acts as president before his Congress was dismissed he appointed a, a large number of judges of the federal judiciary, um, district court judges, appellate court judges, justices of the peace. Technically, John Marshall was part of that. John Marshall was part of those mm. midnight appointments by John Adams. When Thomas Jefferson took office, um, James Madison came in as his secretary of state. Not all of the judicial um, the, the judicial appointments had been delivered. The judicial warrants that, that gave them the authority to work had been delivered. And President Jefferson directed Secretary of State Madison, don't deliver this petition to Marbury. He literally said, don't deliver this petition. That ended up working its way up through the Supreme Court. And for the first time, the Supreme Court looked at the act of Congress that led to Marbury receiving his commission. And they said that Congress exceeded its authority by uh, establishing that commission because Marbury was getting a new court. Um, and as a result, um, it was unconstitutional for him to be commissioned in the first place. Um, as I said, mm. that's an incredibly, inc incredibly, very superficial view of what that case is. There are, there are mm -hmm. books and books written all about that because that established what we understand to be the Supreme Court. All the cases that go up there now where people are asking the court to find something constitutional or unconstitutional, that all goes back to Marbury versus Madison. If not for that well, case, the Supreme Court looks completely different. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it. And, and so, so that's a monumental case that kind of helps establish the Supreme court as a whole, at least, at least to get it on its feet, if you will. Uh, Jack, let's look at, I'm curious, I'm curious about the standpoint from, from, um, you know, of the justices, you know, especially at this point in time, what qualifications does somebody need to serve on the, the Supreme court back then, especially, you know, during the midnight appointments, uh, and what did the demographics look like across the Supreme Court during this time? Sure. The qualifications to be a justice of the Supreme Court back in uh, the early 19th century, the exact same qualifications that exist today, which is, I assume you just have to be breathing. Um, there really are no formal qualifications anywhere. They, the, the Constitution lays out formal qualifications to become president or, or a member of the House of Representatives of the Senator. But there are no federal qualification requirements, constitutional requirements to be a justice of the Supreme Court. Um, the only thing that all of the wow. justices have in common is like they are all lawyers. You know, we've never had a non-lawyer mm -hmm. on the Supreme Court. 
Uh, an interesting mm-hmm. trivia point, though, is not all of the justices actually went to law school. The concept of what we understand oh. as being formal law school is more of an early I mean, there were formal law schools before but the concept of mm-hmm. everyone goes to law school uh, is a little bit more of a recent invention uh, of the 20th century uh, in fact the last justice that served on the supreme court who did not go to law school was uh, justice james Bur- james burns who was on the court from 1941 to 1942 that was the last justice that didn't actually go to law school wow um, wow, it, it's mind boggling to yeah. think to think that there there it's such a vague concept uh, of who who you know who can be qualified to serve in such a massive position that we view today. That's that is a fascinating concept. It but, really is. So, so I I mean just given the, the the true power of what those you know what a justice can accomplish in a given lifetime is is unfathomable so so the the lack of you know a defined qualification is is staggering um and so so where do we lie with the demographics though demographically speaking uh the history of the supreme court is it, it, it it's there's there have not been as many justices as as one might think everyone knows that we have uh that we've had uh 46 presidents um you know an, an uncounted number of representatives and senators, et cetera, et cetera. Um, There have been, in the history of the Supreme Court, there have been 103 total associate justices of the United States from 1789 to the present. Five of those associate justices went on to become chief justices. We've had only a total of 17 chief justices of the United States. So that means that in the history of this country, for, for the um what is that 200 230 some odd years we have only had um 117 people if my math is correct i might be a little bit off on the math a uh, hundred some odd uh 100, less than 120 individual people have ever served on the supreme court of the united states um which is a, 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 a remarkably low number for what they've got um Various judiciary acts over the years have changed the makeup of the court, as as we mentioned earlier with uh, Chief Justice John Jay. The Judiciary Act of 1789 uh, initially set the number of justices of the court at six. Um, That was the Chief Justice and the five Associate Justices. The number of justices uh, was increased to seven in 1837. Um, that was bumped up to nine uh, a couple of years later. And in 1863, we had the highest number of justices that we've ever had on the Supreme Court at 10. Now, one of the one of the powers that Congress has is Congress does have the power to shrink or expand the court at its will. And we'll talk about court packing as we move on with, uh, with our discussion mm-hmm. of the history of the court. Uh, yeah. One of the times that Congress shrank it um, – in 1866, Congress passed the Judicial Circuits Act, which shrank the number of justices back down to seven, mostly because they wanted to prevent President Andrew Johnson from appointing anybody to the Supreme Court. President Johnson was so unpopular, they want Congress wanted to prevent him from doing anything that they possibly could that would leave a legacy following President Lincoln. So they shrank wow. the number of justices. They took justices away from him specifically to prevent him from putting anybody on the court. Um, and then after after he was out of office, um, three years later in 1869, with the judicial uh, with the Judiciary Act of 1869, Congress re-raised the number of justices to nine, which is where it stood since. So we've had nine mm-hmm. justices since 1869. That seems to have been the most consistent number that we've had. Um, but we have had as few as six justices, and we've had as many as uh, ten. So that's that's kind of the the demographic yeah. switch on that over the years. So, so we had, you know, the, the court itself was established, John Jay being really the, the first chief justice, you know, with his, with his uh, really outward movements, the, you know, the red cloak, the, the uh, or red robes rather, you know, the lack of a wig. Then, you know, we've seen that we see the fluctuation with the number of justices as we're starting to move towards the civil war. Those uh, well, keep, keep, bring us up to speed, Jack, 
on what the Supreme Court looked like. Uh, some maybe some of those early decisions again, just as we're the, some of those early years, really moving through the Civil War, because obviously that was such a point of turmoil for our country. You know, f- the federal the branches of the federal government were hard at work trying to figure out what the heck the country was going to look like beyond the Civil War. Talk to us about the Supreme Court and, and how it ebbed and flowed throughout this time period. It was pretty steady for a number of years up through the uh, Civil War. John Marshall, um, as we mentioned, took over as the fourth chief justice in 1801. He served on the court for um, 34 years. He, he, he died in office in 1835. Um, that is still the record for a sitting chief justice. That is the longest time that a chief justice has actually served in office. And the decisions of of the the Marshall Court again really really shaped the judiciary. Um, other major decisions that came from the Marshall Court included uh, Fletcher versus Peck, which was the first time that um, the Supreme Court ruled that an individual state statute was unconstitutional. Uh, Martin versus Hunter's Lessee, which uh, indicated that the Supreme Court of the United States had appellate authority over state courts if it raised a question of federal law. Um, McCullough versus Maryland, which basically said that states have no authority to tax uh, federal institutions, which is a really important thing as we get to things like the nullification crisis and some of the really hot buildup to the, to the Civil War. Um, Gibbons versus Ogden, which was the first co- uh, Commerce Clause decision that Supreme Court ever issued. Um, and, and an interesting one, Barron versus Baltimore, which held that the Bill of Rights did not apply to the individual states. Um, historically, when the Supreme Court, um, not the Supreme Court, when, when the Constitution was first written and the Bill of Rights was added, the Bill of Rights was designed to protect citizens against actions of the federal government not the state government. The, the, the Bill of Rights would become applied to the several states through a doctrine called incorporation using the 14th Amendment, but that really doesn't happen until about 1925. So those are, those are kind of the very stable rulings that are kind of fleshing out the federal judiciary. And mm-hmm. then um, the first major, major change does happen in 1835 with the passing of John Jay and Roger Taney being appointed by President Andrew Jackson to succeed him as Chief Justice. And John Marshall and Roger Taney were very different personality, very different personality wise, different philosophically wise. Um, the, the differences in their judicial temperaments were pretty significant. Chief Justice Taney's tenure um, as as Chief Justice did have a number of extremely important decisions, several of which actually are still heard today um, or still control today. The, the, The first decision that he was involved in as Chief Justice of the United States was the Charles River Bridge versus Warren Bridge, which established the authority or or established that um, states cannot contract out eminent domain. The facts of that case is uh, Massachusetts had given a uh, had been given by the Massachusetts General Assembly a a um, ninety year toll road exclusive lease for a bridge going over the Charles River, uh, which made a lot of sense, I suppose, back in you know seventeen seventeen ninety when you know Boston sure. was a much smaller area. Um, but as the city grew and as there was a need for more bridges. Um, the city said, it's like, all right, well, we're just going to build another bridge. And they didn't put a toll road on it. Mm. And the Charles River Bridge Company sued Massachusetts, arguing that this interfered with their contractual exclusivity and that the state had bargained away um, its ability to, to make improvements. And the Tawny Court looked at that and said, no, the states can't do that. You know, the state cannot bargain away the ability to improve the lives of their citizenry through contract. Um, so that, that was a huge decision. It was a huge states' rights decision. It's a huge decision that's kind of still reverberates today with regards to the concept of how states are supposed to, um, you know, interact with their citizens, you know, road improvements, um, you know, infrastructure, things like fiber optic internet, things of that. So that like all that goes back to the Charles River Bridge case. So right, again, that's, right. that's a huge case. And mm-hmm. other major decisions that, that Tawny was involved in, um, you know, mayor of New York City versus Milne was the first case that decided and really established the issue that there are these police powers 
that the states have inherently to regulate things mm -hmm. like health and safety. Um, that was a big issue that kept coming up over sure. and over again during the COVID-19 pandemic is like the states can take these steps um, to, to ensure the health of their citizens. That's something that we wouldn't have if it weren't for Tawny. Same situation wow. with the uh, the license cases, which further direct, further develop those police powers. And um, probably the biggest, the second biggest decision that Tawny was involved in was Luther versus Borden, which kind of established the boundaries of what the Supreme Court will and will not do as mm -hmm. far as their decision-making power is concerned. One of the things that the court says when they're handing down decisions or they're de declining to hear cases is the court will not answer a political question. And a political question is something along the lines of, um, oh, you know, is is this person fit for office or, you know, is this a good law or a bad law? They don't make those decisions. The only thing that they do look at is whether or not the law has been followed. That's the judicial restraint that came up under Tawny. And if it weren't for one really, really, really bad decision. Um, I think that Roger Tawney would probably be much more remembered in the modern era, but as a result of that decision, it made the Civil War all but inevitable and made Tawney in the modern era basically a pariah in his own country. And that case, because you can't talk about the history of the Supreme Court without mentioning it, is the Dred Scott versus Sanford decision. Mm -hmm. And the Dred Scott decision, for the people listening who uh, might not know what that is, it was a it was a decision by the Supreme Court. Um, Dred Scott was a slave. He had been taken from a slaveholding state in the South to the North. Um, he had remained in the North for several years, and when his uh, when his owner, master, is like, I, I guess we got to be historically, his master wanted to take him back down to the South. He sued in federal court to prevent that, arguing that, you know, I have been in the North, the state that I've been in uh, does not recognize slavery. I am a free man. The Supreme Court went overboard on deciding the issue. Um, above and beyond just deciding the jurisdictional issue of whether or not Dred Scott had standing to sue in a federal court as a slave. Mm. The Supreme Court went beyond that to say that not only could slaves not sue in federal court, slaves could not sue in any court because slaves weren't people, basically. They were, they were property, and property mm. cannot go to court. Um, that had the impact of invalidating uh, the Missouri Compromise. The Missouri Compromise was an agreement that, uh, that the Congress had come up with a number of years earlier that said, okay, we will admit two states simultaneously every time, one slave state, one free state to, do, to maintain this balance. It basically invalidated the Missouri Compromise. Um, and it was, it was a huge, huge political backlash. It actually yeah. led to... The rise of the Republican Party. The Republican Party uh, was created as an abolitionist party, uh, very largely in in response to this decision. And uh, of course, as we all know, a few years later, Abraham Lincoln was the party's first nominee for president of the United States, and ended up winning. And the Civil War happened. To his credit, to the extent that I would like to say that Tawney was trying to do something correct. The Dred Scott decision came out not long after the the historical situation that we refer to as bleeding Kansas, where effectively the concept of popular sovereignty was that each individual state and territory was going to decide for itself whether it was a free state or a slave state. Kansas became effectively a battleground over uh, over pro-slavery and anti-slavery factions. Uh, and to say it was bloody was was an understatement. It was like as a precursor to the Civil War, it was probably a good picture of like, oh, this is how bad this is going to get. Right, right. What, what I think that Tawny was trying to do, and, and you know, just like everyone else who studies these things, I'm putting words in the mouth of a, of a man who's been dead for a couple centuries at this point in time. Um, it, it really seemed like he was trying to settle the issue and try to forestall the Civil War. What ended up happening instead, though, is it basically made the Civil War an inevitability. By, by removing mm -hmm. that from the political process, which is ironic given the, given the decisions that they were involved in about how the court's not going to answer political questions. Uh, 
that created a situation where war at that point in time was basically inevitable because you were never mm-hmm. going to get Congress at that point in time to agree that this is a political legal issue that we can resolve. And as a result of that, despite the fact that the man was a brilliant jurist, the man was responsible for several decisions that, again, are, are still important and still adhere to today, that decision so overshadowed his legacy and so overshadowed his career um, that he's largely forgotten. And when people do remember him, he is vilified at this point in time. They, yeah. They've removed any memorial to him, any reference to him from most public universities. And, you know, it's... History, the thing that we have to remember is, is history is made of imperfect people. And, you know, Tawny was an imperfect person who made imperfect decisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, for what it's worth, he stayed with the Union. He was a staunch Unionist. When he was offered the position of Chief Justice of the Confederacy, he told Jefferson Davis to screw off, and he stayed with the Union. And this is a man <laughs> that didn't even get along with Lincoln very well. They had a lot of personality clashes. Wow. 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 Well, you know, what's really interesting about this point in time. I mean, the Civil War, obviously, at its core is about one of the most fundamental civil rights discussions that our country's ever had. Mm -hmm. And for such a big moment in our country's history, this is a big moment for the Supreme Court. You know, there's a lot of massive decisions that are going to be made about how our country is going to handle these situations moving forward. So, Talk to me about what the post Civil War era looked like, Jack, for the from you know from the Supreme Court standpoint, and you know what kind of amendments were made, you know, as, as segregation started to creep into the picture. Talk to us about this and and really what the Supreme Court looked like. Of course, not just after the Civil War, but in those years following, and then really what we found to be kind of the the bulk really of of the early 1900s. Sure. Um, Post Civil War, the, the landscape of the American law changed significantly following the Civil War. The first and most um, obvious result of that were the passage of what are referred to as the Civil War Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Um, the 13th Amendment um, specifically said that no man shall be held in bondage in the United States. Um, Interestingly enough, unless they were convicted for a crime and sentenced to slavery as a result of their sentence, there's a lot of there's a lot of politics behind that. But that's that's a discussion for a different day. But it it outlawed slavery nationwide. Um, The 14th Amendment um, did two things. It granted birthright citizenship to everyone who was born in the United States. um, And it established that the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States or the several states shall not be abridged. This was in direct response. The 13th and 14th were very clearly in direct response to the Dred Scott versus Sanford case. One of the powers that Congress has, um, or more specifically, even the states have, is if they disagree with a Supreme Court decision, they can change the law or they can pass an amendment, which is exactly what they did here. And then the final Civil War Amendment was the 15th Amendment, uh, which was the amendment that granted... uh, Blacks the right to vote it basically says that the the right to vote cannot be denied on the basis of race. So we've got three new amendments, and the decision now comes down to how are these going to play out? What what is this going to look like? How are we going to deal with the switch over from being a, a slave owning country or a partially slave owning country to a completely free slave pre country? Uh, with with now freedmen kind of leaving the South, staying in the South, going everywhere, mm-hmm. all this stuff has to get interpreted by the courts. And I'm sorry to say that they did not always interpret it in a way that we would think is particularly fair and just. Sure. Um, well, as as we've learned through United States versus Ship, as sure. well as all sorts of other cases, I mean, it takes us a while to get there. Let's put it that way. Um, exactly. But but yeah. To, to, how how did this this ripple effect happen? Well, the first major decision that interpreted any of the Civil War amendments uh, was the Slaughterhouse Cases, which is a case out of Chicago. It came down to the concept of trying to determine whether or not the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment, what that actually meant. And the issue that it came down to is the court made a distinction between substantive due process rights and economic due process rights. And, and very briefly, what that means is that the privileges and immunities clause protected the substantive procedures. As long as the procedures of the law are being followed, 
um, the privileges and immunities clause, your due process, you know, without due process of law, that refers to the the substantive provisions of how a case would work its way through the court system, how it would, um, you know, what the procedures are for filing suit, how a fair trial looks. Um, the concept of economic privileges and immunities was basically flatly rejected by the court. That would be the idea that uh, an individual citizen has some sort of economic privilege or immunity from state statute or state law. The slaughterhouse cases specifically involved um, hog butchers who were challenging state statutes regarding health and safety regulations on the basis that the statutes violated their economic privileges and immunities to effectively do what they wanted. It was a very early form of laissez-faire capitalism. Uh, and the Supreme Court shot that down. So that's that's the first concept right there with regards to the first major interpretation of one of the Civil War amendments. Mm -hmm. The next handful of decisions were not all that great for minorities. Um, the first one would be United States versus Reese, which upheld the concept that poll taxes were constitutional as long as everyone had to pay them. This the poll tax, as uh, as as people who study United States history know, was a tax that uh, most Southern states would impose. That before you could vote, you had to pay a tax of a certain type, or you had to pass a literacy test, or something on those lines. The impact was that most poor blacks in that era were not capable of paying these taxes. They simply didn't have the money to. And as a result, their vote was effectively disenfranchised. This is right at the beginning of the Jim Crow era. But the Supreme Court took the position that because the law is race neutral, because everyone, white and black, are at least supposed to pay it, even though I think we all know that most whites didn't have to end up paying this tax, um, it was a perfectly fine law. So that was that was definitely a kick in the gut to, to the concept of equality under the law. Sure. Uh, Minor versus Happersat was another decision that came out of this time. That one um, was a federal decision that indicated that there was no constitutional right for women to vote. Um, that was a unanimous decision, you know. So that's another setback for minority rights at right. that point in time. Is you know the Supreme Court says there's not a federal guarantee that women can vote. That of course eventually got reversed by the 19th Amendment. Uh, but unanimously, mm -hmm. the court says, like, there's no right for women to vote in this. So that's another step backwards for sure for that. Um, but the single the, the, the two single biggest slaps in the face to the concept of of the fight for equality that the Supreme Court did during that time frame were the civil rights cases in Plessy versus Ferguson. The civil mm -hmm. rights cases was an attempt by uh, by freed black men to argue that they were being discriminated against in violation of the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1867 um, in, in public accommodations or private streetcars, things of that nature. And the Supreme Court punted that issue and they punted it hard. What the decision of the civil rights cases was is that the 13th Amendment protected against discrimination by state actors. So basically, the state government couldn't discriminate against you, but it had absolutely no impact on private actors. So if a business did not want to sell to a black person, they didn't have to. If they didn't want to sell to a Chinese person, they didn't have to. If they didn't want to sell to a woman, they didn't have to. Um, the 13th Amendment did not protect against that. That was the decision of the Supreme Court. And then very quickly on the heels of that, was the Plessy versus Ferguson decision, which established segregation, which, you know, was uh, was a blight on the country for the better part of a century. You know, these were major yeah. issues that the Supreme Court did not get right. And, and that's really about all you can say as far as that's concerned. They didn't get yeah. it right. And yeah. they set a lot of that stuff back. But that is part of the history of the court. That was their jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. And that's how they approached the situation. But to that to that point, they didn't get a lot right during this time frame. I mean, I think the country there was still so much to figure out uh, after after you know the Civil War itself, and from a from a societal standpoint, obviously from a judicial standpoint, there was a lot that needed to happen for us to start making real progress towards what we've seen today. 
talk to me about what then kind of moves us into this this era really that we know as called the Lochner era you know where does this begin and and how and how does this kind of begin to start moving the needle a little bit you know towards more modern day history that we know the Supreme Court as sure the Lochner era is is really the first major shift in the Supreme Court jurisprudence of the 20th century the Lochner era um, refers basically to the time frame between 1905 and 1937. Um, this time period, the Supreme Court was very, very, de depending on your viewpoint, um, either very heavily pro-individual rights or uh, very anti-state regulation. The Lochner time period was a time period where the Supreme Court was rather heavily ruling against state and federal statutes that tried to limit the rights of individuals to enter into a contract. It was a very pure contractual interpretation court. Lochner versus New York, which is where we get that era's name from, involved striking down a state law that limited the maximum number of hours that a baker could work during a workable week. The state of New York set basically the maximum amount of time that a baker could work at 60 hours per week. Uh, Lochner sued and the Supreme Court basically said that if the state statute interfered with Lochner's uh, ability to contract his labor out, that's a violation of the contract clause with the federal constitution and the state can't do that. Mm. So that struck down the Lochner, that, that starts with the Lochner decision other major decisions that came up during the Lochner era, just to give you an idea as to how, how I pro capital, I guess, for like a better way of describing it, the Lochner era courts were. Um, the the other major ones were uh, Hamner versus Dagenhart, which struck down anti child labor laws again on the theory that you know if these children wanted to work, who are we to tell the children not to work? And um, Atkins versus a Children's Hospital, which struck down the very first minimum wage laws that we had in this country. The argument being that uh, businesses themselves can enter into contract with individuals. And if a business wants to offer X and the person wants to contract to work for X, then the state's not going to get involved in it. So, again, a very, very hands off era for the court that started to change in 1937. Um, by this point in time, we're, we're getting very into the modern history. We're not that far off from the start of World War I. Franklin Delano Roosevelt is now the president. And part of Franklin Roosevelt's platform was he wanted to get America working again, uh, get it back on its feet because of the Great Depression. He had a number of uh, the New Deal policies. That was his platform as a New Deal. A lot of them kept getting struck down by the Supreme Court, again, under that Lochner era jurisprudence. And one of the things that Roosevelt noticed is, as we discussed, the Judiciary Act of um, the, the Judiciary Act of, of 1869 set the number of justices at nine, but it wasn't a constitutional requirement. There's no requirement as to how many justices could or couldn't be on the Supreme Court. We'd had up to ten at one point in time. Mm -hmm. Roosevelt's concept was like, oh, well, you know, we'll just add more justices to the Supreme Court until I get what I want out of it. There you go. Um, Tr chief Justice Charles Evan Hughes, who was the chief justice of the time, uh, in his autobiography indicated that the threats from President Roosevelt had absolutely no decision, no impact on their decision that largely reversed the Lochner era. Um, However, if you've ever heard of the um, the, the the old saying, uh, a switch in time saves nine, that's where that came from. Mm -hmm. the, the case that that came up with was uh, West Coast uh, Hotel versus Parish in 1937, which upheld a state minimum wage law, which is basically a direct reversal of Adkins versus Children's Hospital about 10 years prior to that. Um, and that was that was that was a five four decision, but it went the government's way, and all of a sudden the New Deal seemed like hunky dory, and uh, any discussion regarding court packing disappeared for about another ninety or so years. Um, <laughs> but that's that's where that phrase comes from. The phrase "a switch in time saves nine. That's that's what that refers to. That's that is the switch in time that saved nine justices.
Well, yeah, the switch in time being this idea of of packing the court, going that route to to get what you want. So so as we're moving towards world the World War Two era, um, you know, there's this idea of of where you know moving into a marble palace comes into play. Uh, shed some light on what this is. Um, you know, we're moving into the civil, or I'm sorry, the uh, World War Two here. What does the Supreme Court look like as we are moving out of the Lochner era and into this, you know, into this world war? The single biggest thing that kind of happens in this concept, and, and interestingly enough, the Supreme Court's change of the, the move that we're talking about right now, that really actually happened during the Lochner era. It, it, it was it, the move to the Supreme Court chambers happened just before the end of the Lochner era. Um, the Supreme Court didn't have its own building for for a very, very long time. Um, when the Supreme Court first met in 1790, uh, they met in New York City, which was the uh, the nation's capital at the time. Uh, from 1791 to 1800, it was in Philadelphia. And then from uh, 1801, moving forward, the Supreme Court basically met in the basement of the Senate. The, the Senate chambers in Congress, there was a large basement, and that's where the Supreme Court actually met. So for, for over 100 years, that's where the Supreme Court was, was, was very clearly beneath Congress. Wow. And yeah. um, in 1929, uh, Chief Justice William Taft, who, who was the only person who was ever both president and a Supreme Court justice, uh, President Taft went to Congress in 1929 and said, look, I'm pretty sure you want your basement back and we really like to not be in the basement. So uh, how sure. about we actually have some place that we can call our own? Uh, Congress appropriated mm -hmm. the funds and the Supreme Court chambers that we have today, the Marble Palace, as it's referred, um, opened for the court in 1935. Uh, they moved into they moved into the, the chambers at that point in time. They've been there ever since. It's it is a um, it, it's a very impressive architectural um, execution. It, it really is. I've, I've mm -hmm. been there a couple of times. Uh, but the Supreme Court's only had its own building. It's, it hasn't even been a century since they've had it. It's, it's kind of funny to think about it that way, in the basement of the Senate, yeah. just borrowing some space, almost a tenant, yep. if you will. Yep, yep. So, <laughs> um, you know, that, well, that happened, and and then, you know, of course, right. World War II happens not long afterwards. Sure, sure. So so they they get the Marble Palace, they move in, they've really asserted their, their space physically now within the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, Jack, we have World War II. We're starting to move towards a very pivotal time. Most of us are well aware of what was the civil rights era. Talk to me about, and I feel like for most of us here, you know, as we sit down to record this episode today, I feel like most of us view a lot of the Supreme Court's work uh, in recent history, perhaps kind of centers around the civil rights era. And then of course, what we've experienced in the last you know decade, few decades or so since then, Walk us through really where the incorporation of the Bill of Rights happens once we start moving into the civil rights era. Talk to us about the Supreme Court's role throughout what a lot of us view to be such just a pivotal time uh, for our country and their laws. Definitely post-World War II, things changed very significantly with the way the, the Supreme Court interacted with the application of rights to the public. Um, by this point in time, of course, uh, the 19th Amendment had passed. Women were given the right to vote. Um, you've got returning GI segregation was ended at least in the military at this point in time. It wasn't, it wasn't, it was going to be a few more years where it's ended nationwide. Um, but the court did start looking a little bit more liberally for life better way of putting it broadly. It's like, I, I try not to use like the political terms on that because it, it's not completely accurate, but they were looking at more expansively protecting the rights of individuals, um, in the country. The, the doctrine of incorporation, as I mentioned previously, the, the Bill of Rights, as it was originally written, was only applicable to the federal government. That is what the Bill of Rights was supposed to protect against were, were issues with the federal government. The state governments, it was not applied to. That started to change in 1925. In 1925, the court started to use the due process clause of the 14th Amendment to argue that the substantive due process provisions of the 14th Amendment also meant that a state could not deprive their citizens of a right that would actually uh, 
be uh, be uh, protected to them by the federal government, by the federal Bill of Rights. Um, the the first cases that incorporated provisions of the Bill of Rights to the state of uh, to the various states came out of 1920, excuse me, 1925 with the case of Getlow versus New York, which established that the federal protections for free speech and uh, the free press, those are applicable to the states through the 14th Amendment. So a state cannot abridge a citizen's rights to free speech or their right to free press uh, under the uh, under the Constitution of the United States. They get those rights. Most of the incorporation um, has focused around the the First Amendment. Um, it's it's a little bit easier to uh, to explain what rights from the Bill of Rights have not been incorporated. Um, the right to a grand jury indictment under the Fifth Amendment has not been incorporated to the states. And interestingly enough, the right to a jury of residents from the state or district where a crime happened, which is part of the Sixth Amendment, that's also not been incorporated by the states. Nothing from the Seventh Amendment has been incorporated to the states, which deals with the right of uh, jury trials and civil cases. Um, but nearly at this point in time, everything from the Bill of Rights has been incorporated. And the most recent one, if you recall way back to our first episode when we were talking about forfeitures and Tyson Timms and his Land Rover, that was the incorporation of the Eighth Amendment prohibition against excessive fines to the state. So you know, this, this, this is a constantly evolving process. It's not a situation where mm -hmm. it's ever done. Because again, Timms right. was Tim's was only a little over a year or so ago. So even as recently mm -hmm. as 2021, we're still incorporating the Bill of Rights to make sure the citizens actually do get right. the rights. Right. And, and that's a that's a big, over, uh, you know, overarching theme of, of today's episode is that, you know, we're working our way up to modern history here with the Supreme Court and how things are constantly evolving. I mean, we're going to see innovations that the Supreme Court makes here, um, you know, in the next decade, you know, within future decades. I mean, things are things will likely change. There will likely be decisions that are handed down that alter the way we function as a society. I mean, here we are, we're going through the civil rights era. And boy, has that made a massive impact on how we handle ourselves from just a societal standpoint. So so walk me through then, Jack, um, where Chief Justice Earl Warren comes into play. Uh, obviously, Earl Warren had a massive, massive hand throughout the civil rights era. Talk to us about him and, and uh, you know, the, the impact he left. Earl Warren, in my opinion, it's hard to say whether Earl Warren was more or less important than John Marshall. Those are certainly the two most important chief justices this country has ever had. John Marshall, because he created what we think of the judiciary. Um, and if Earl Warren isn't more important than John Marshall, he's certainly the number two chief justice of all time behind him because of his impact on the public as a whole. Uh, Earl Warren, Chief Justice Earl Warren was the Chief Justice um, through, through the later part of the 50s, through most of the 60s. And the changes in civil rights and, and the way the courts addressed those situations, it was, modern society would not look the way that it did if without Earl Warren being Chief Justice. Um, just prior to uh, Earl Warren taking over as Chief Justice under the Vinson Court, the real big push to ending segregation started under um, under, under two cases uh, that were decided on the same day in 1950, Sweat versus Painter and McLaurin versus Oklahoma State Regents that were actually decided under the, the Vinson Court, the, the court immediately prior to the Warren Court. Those cases held that Racial segregation and discrimination in law school admissions and graduate school admissions um, were unconstitutional. There was no legal basis to justify the separate but equal doctrine under Plessy versus Ferguson. And those two cases were the springboard that the Warren Court used for Brown versus Board of Education to reverse segregation nationwide. And that decision sent shockwaves through the United States. Uh, there were mm -hmm. calls to impeach Earl Warren in the South. Even the North didn't really know what to do with it. Um, sure, sure. It's monumental. But it was a huge, huge shift in the law. Again, we're talking we're, we're talking overturning six decades of legal yeah. precedent at that point in time. And it was a huge departure for the court. But the Warren court wasn't done with. You know, the Warren court wasn't done as far as, as what they were going to do as far as civil rights were concerned. Um, no, no, they pushed forward. Just 
just just getting to criminal law cases that the Warren court uh, the decided. We've talked about Miranda versus Arizona previously. Mm-hmm. Brady versus Maryland was another case that that the Warren court oversaw that basically says that the state can't hide evidence from defendants. Um, Matt versus Ohio basically held that if evidence is illegally seized in state courts, you can't use it there. That incorporated the Fourth Amendment to the states. Uh, Gideon versus Wainwright, that guaranteed the right to counsel if you can't actually afford it. And Escobedo versus Illinois guaranteed that right to counsel at police interrogations. Terry versus Ohio. Yeah, Yeah, Terry versus Ohio, that establishes the way that police can actually stop and ask to speak with people. Like, have you ever seen an officer like, hey, I'd like to talk to you. Come over here. I want to pat you down for officer safety. That all comes out of the Terry versus Ohio decision. And that's not to say that they just did criminal law cases there were a lot of free speech cases there um, yeah new york times versus sullivan is is the def is is the standard for how defamation works in the courts today uh brandenburg versus ohio talked about whether or not things like hate speech can be outlawed across the board mm-hmm. students were given constitutional protections for speech in in tinker versus des moines school the independent school district the, that yeah. the impact that warren earl warren his court <laughs> had on society incredible no no and, and think about the time frame as well you know the the post world war ii you know night like 1950s you know on think about the you know technological innovations that we had um you know processing and system changes that we all endured you know we 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 have gone through that was such a mat i mean obviously just look at the technological innovations that we've seen in the last decade let alone during that time frame, I mean, we have we as a society have made monumental strides during that time frame of Warren's Warren's tenure. And my lord, was he exposed to just so many different new things happening from a societal standpoint at that time? I mean, you're right. The his the footprint that he left, um, you know, on <clears throat> some of these decisions is is just it can't be stressed enough so where does that take us then you know obviously we we've been discussing the supreme court's role jack throughout um throughout the civil war and and obviously with segregation coming into play how does the civil how does the supreme court you know continue its role warren specifically involved in the fight to kind of end segregation and move beyond that well, again, you know, Warren, Earl Warren was the chief justice with Brown versus Board of Education. They oversaw the the judicial termination of segregation. Um, the number of decisions that that Earl Warren, his court was responsible for, given some of the fundamental changes that they that came out of it, it was inevitable there was going to be pushback on. It. And this is really where you start to see the Supreme Court become a little bit more of a hot potato issue. Um, one mm-hmm. of the last decisions that Earl Warren, Chief Justice Warren was involved in um, involved medical privacy situations. That was the case of Griswold versus Connecticut, which was the case that basically said that states can't outlaw birth control. Um, it, you know, if, if whether you're married and, and involved in family planning, whether you're single and just want birth control, Um, Griswold versus Connecticut said that you can't outlaw that. Um, Earl Warren was off of the court. He had retired by the time the next, probably behind Plessy versus Ferguson, Dred Scott, Brown versus Board of Education, equally fundamentally major for how the court and how the public perceives the court came up. And that was the case of Roe versus Wade, which if somehow you've been living under a rock for the last... 50 years is the case that indicates that there is a a constitutional guarantee to an abortion because it it falls under the umbrella of uh, private medical decisions that are covered by Griswold, by covered by other decisions with regards to uh, search and seizures and privacy. Um, There's no way we're getting into that topic in any way, shape or form in today's episode. Way too much of it have to go on with that. But as a result of all these decisions, you did start to see a little bit of pushback. And that's where the Federalist Society comes in. The Federalist mm-hmm. Society is, is basically a fraternal organization of lawyers. It, it was founded in 1982 as a reaction very much to those 1960s and 1970s expansions of, of individual rights. And, and I don't want to make it sound like the Federal Society is, is just a bunch of reactionary, angry people. I know that's the public perception they've got with them. Mm-hmm. Their position was very much on the issue of 
the Constitution is not a living document. The Constitution is simply a document that says this is what the law is. Basically, kind of going back to the Lochner era situation, like this is what the law is. If you don't like the law, change the law. Don't rely on the courts to grant new rights that they're coming out of with thin air. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you can change it. There's a procedure for changing it. Right. Um, and and it cannot be understated just how influential the Federalist Society has become over the last 40 years. Um, six of the nine justices on the Supreme Court today ha- are either current or former members of the Federalist Society. Um, the the three decade plan for remaking the judiciary worked. And a lot of the judicial positions that were filled, especially under Republican administrations, have been either members of the Federalist Society or vetted by the Federalist Society. And that's that's been part of that political hot potato. But the first place where it really, really became a big thing is with the nomination of Robert Bork to the Supreme Court in 1987. Uh, Robert Bork was uh, nominated uh, to the Supreme Court to, to fill Lewis Powell's seat. And for the first time ever, there was a concentrated effort by members of the United States Senate, specifically the Democratic Party, because, of course, Reagan was a Republican, to prevent a Supreme Court nominee from being seated. That's not to say that every nominee had been seated prior to this point, but this was a very strong pushback. Like Within minutes of Bork being nominated or or his nomination being announced, Senator Ted Kennedy, brother of President Kennedy, uh, brother of Senator Robert Kennedy, um, he took to the Senate floor and loudly proclaimed Robert Bork's America as a land in which women would be forced into back alley abortions, blacks would sit at segregated lunch counters, rogue police could break down citizens' doors in midnight raids, and school children could not be taught evolution. Writers and artists would be censored at the whim of the government, and the doors of the federal courts would be shut on the fingers of millions of citizens. Wow. None of that, for the record, is true. <laughs> you know, sure, if you, sure. If, if you look at Robert Bork's judicial philosophy, Robert Bork, Robert Bork wasn't a member of the Federal Society that I am aware of. The Federal Society would have been around for about five years by that point in time. But mm-hmm. he had that same judicial philosophy. His philosophy was... There are no privacy rights guaranteed to the Constitution other than what is actually written in the Constitution. It was one of the strict originalists, strict construction style ones. And mm-hmm. that was that was a bridge too far. And sure. the Senate confirmation hearings were a knockdown, drag out brawl. Um, it was it came down basically to a party line vote. Um, the in the Senate. 50 Democratic senators voted against the confirmation of Robert Bork versus two in favor. Uh, It was virtually reversed on the Republican side. 40 Republican senators voted for confirmation versus six against. Uh, Robert Bork was soundly defeated, Um, but he he was defined to the end. A lot of people expected him to withdraw his nomination, but he he basically made them do the floor call vote on that. Mm -hmm. That was the That was the first time. If if you want to look at the concept of the Supreme Court as being a brawl, that's where it happened. And in fact, there's there's a word that came into the political lexicon called borking somebody and refers almost specifically to judges. But the idea is that you create a concentrated effort for the purposes of defeating a judicial nomination. We have that verb because Mm -hmm. of Robert Bork, that the phrase borking came into it. Um, the next time that would be a big issue was with Clarence Thomas's nomination. Mm-hmm. To the Supreme Court. Right, right. The, the political hot potato continues. Yep, it absolutely did. And and in fact, uh, members of the end, Clarence Thomas was always going to face an uphill battle because he was replacing mm-hmm. Thurgood Marshall, who was the first black member of the Supreme Court. Uh, Thurgood Marshall was instrumental in getting segregation overturned in Brown versus Board of Education. So replacing someone who politically was that far on the left, or at least the perception of being that far on the left, with Clarence Thomas, who, of course, as we as we know now with a hindsight of 30 years, um, is pretty solidly very strict constructionalist. Uh, Thomas actually was a member, actually is still a member of the Federalist Society. Um Members of the NAACP and and members of the National Organization of Women, they went on record saying, we're going to bork his nomination. Again, that's that's how much that really made that a political hot potato issue. Um, 
Now, Thomas ended up getting confirmed. As we know, Thomas is still on the court to this day. Uh, but again, it was a very contentious nomination process. And uh, a fun piece of trivia, the head of the Senate Judiciary Committee during both the Robert Bork nominations as well as the Clarence Thomas nominations, uh, one President Joseph Biden. So President Biden was uh, was mm -hmm. head of the Judiciary Committee during both of those. Um, I know that we're getting short on time. I want to kind of hit the end for the hot, put, hot button issue because this is the stuff that's getting really, really important as far as now is concerned. The next big hot yeah. button issue, of course, was uh, with President Obama's nominations and President Trump's nominations. Mm -hmm. um, by the time that President Obama had nominated uh, Merrick Garland to fill Antonin Scalia's uh, seat after he passed away, uh, the, the Senate was firmly in Republican hands and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell refused to even give him a nomination. Mm -hmm. The result was after President Trump won the election, they moved forward with his first pick, Neil Gorsuch. The Democratic Party attempted to filibuster the nomination of Gorsuch, which resulted in the elimination of the filibuster for Supreme Court nominees. Previously, the Democratic Party, during the beginning of the second term of President Obama, had removed the filibuster for lower court nominees um, because of uh, perceived Republican uh, opposition to allowing them to go forward. As a result of that tit for tat, the Supreme Court now became the next political battleground on that with regards to um, trying to prevent uh, trying to prevent any type of stopgap on that. So the filibuster is removed. Pre you know, Justice Gorsuch gets gets nominated. You're again, it's very very clearly a, a down the line party vote. Then you run into Brett Kavanaugh. Um, that was again a down the line party vote. That was by far, if you thought that Bork's nomination was nasty, the the amount of fighting over Brett Kavanaugh was shockingly horrific. I, I have not seen in the history of the court a a situation where a nominee was fought that hard. Uh, and then, of course, President Trump's last nomination, Amy Barrett, who replaced uh, Ruth Ginsburg, who passed away. Uh, right before the election, um, she was rocketed through pretty quickly because there was no way for anyone to stop that. Right, and that brings us basically to today. Um, as we're mm -hmm. recording this video, um, Judge uh, Kentanji uh, Brown Jackson is currently under consideration, uh, absent something completely unexpected. Even if it sometime somehow comes down to a strict party line vote. Uh, Judge Jackson will be on the Supreme Court. I don't know when they actually have the floor vote scheduled for that. But again, it's just another example of, of the Supreme Court has become this huge political hot potato. And, mm -hmm. you know, for what it's worth, my take on that is, and this is just my personal take, but we seem to have ceded more and more authority for making decisions to the court. You know, Congress yeah. has ceded so much of its authority to do anything that we're relying on the courts to make these decisions which right. makes the court a huge hot button issue. And that's, that's not how they were, that's not how they were designed to function. No, ever. look, look at, look at how our conversation is, is, you know, gone from the start. I mean, look where we started when, I mean, article three was, was so vague. It was so right. vague. And, and, and the actual power that the court held was up for interpretation kind of, Oh uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So look how far we've come you know, from, from that, that idea of what is the power of the Supreme court, how much right. power does it really have? I mean, it's created the political hot potato or some mm -hmm. might say mess that it, we've, we've seen these days. So, Absolutely. I mean, just a lot to unpack with this, Jack. And I, I appreciate you kind of, you know, walking through really the history of the Supreme court with us. I mean, of course, this is a brief history audience, you know, like Jack had mentioned, there are so many of these topics that were mentioned today on the episode that we could, we could spend hours talking about because there's that much detail that's unfold. I mean, think about all the different socio, you know, societal eras that we we've gone through in this history, the, the average viewpoint on so many of these hot button topics, how that's changed over time. There's just a lot of fascinating things that have happened to bring the court from article three of the constitution to, to the powerhouse that it, that it is become today. So uh, Jack, I appreciate you kind of peeling that back and, and really, you know, walking us through all of these, any, any final thoughts maybe that you want to, you know, leave our audience with in regards to the court as a whole. 
two major ones first i think that having watched the evolution of the court we can definitely say that the framers of the constitution were absolutely wrong the supreme court is no longer the least dangerous branch of the federal government um, on some level, it might be the most dangerous branch simply because of the way that it works out. Um, beyond that, if there's anything that we did talk about, like I mentioned before, any of these topics could have covered an entire podcast by itself, probably could have covered multiple podcasts. We read the comments. If you have if you have questions about any of these eras or you're just interested in hearing about it more in depth, let us know. I, I, we're, I am more than happy to come back and discuss this in greater detail. Um, you can you can leave a kind if you're watching this on YouTube, you can leave a comment here. Um, if you're particularly ambitious and you want to call us, you can call us at 317-983-5333. We do handle all criminal cases. I actually am licensed to practice before the Supreme Court of the United States. That's uh, that's that's one of the fun facts that our office has. Um, but you know, we always like hearing from people. You can certainly call in and say, Hey, I want you to talk more about Lochner, I want you to talk more about Korematsu. Like because there were so many cases that we didn't even cover at that point. Right, right. Um, but yeah, just let us know if there's something you want to hear otherwise, and we'll be happy to cover it for you. Awesome. Well, well, thank you, Jack. Again, appreciate you carving some time out of your busy day. We'll let you get back to your practice. But uh, again, um, you know, looking forward to the next uh, next episode where we dive knee deep into another case. Absolutely. Alrighty. And then of course, this one final time, as always, we want to thank you guys, of course, our audience for jumping aboard and being with us on the discussion today, as Jack had just mentioned, uh, if you liked or took anything away from the conversation, maybe you want to hear us tackle a specific, you know, maybe criminal law related topic or anything that we maybe brushed the surface of during today's history of the Supreme Court. Feel free to let us know in that comment section below. And while you're there, go ahead and hit that like button, share this information, right? With friends, family, anybody that you think would benefit from these conversations or finds these criminal law related discussions interesting you know jack and i we've had some great episodes in the past we've got some awesome topics queued up for you guys for future episodes and we would hate to have you miss out on any of those so for jack razimich i'm ryan ruff we're going to go ahead and say so long but we appreciate you joining us on today's installment of closing arguments <laughs>